I'm Linda Donahue. I'm with Cornell University's School of Industrial and Labor Relations, commonly referred to as ILR. And uh, I'm based here in Rochester. I've been active with the Labor Council's Education Committee for many years and uh, have been involved peripherally with organizations like Metro Justice and the Worker Justice Center. Pete, I believe that the uh, Tompkins County Center has been around a while. Can you talk a little bit about what you know about the origins, how it got started, and, uh, and what you actually do now? Right. I'm Pete Myers, and I'm the coordinator for the Tompkins County Worker Center in Ithaca, New York. Um, I was actually one of the co-founders of the Tompkins County Worker Center, and we became a formal organization in January of 2003, which is just a little bit over 10 years ago. Um, we had organized, when I worked at Catholic Charities, there were some organizers, activists in the community that had organized with paraprofessionals. So in the school district, there were teachers' aides and teaching assistants in the school districts that, you know, in many places, oftentimes, they don't make a living wage. Um, presuming that everybody knows what living wage means, would that be? Like this. Does anybody need an explanation of a living wage? So a living, a living wage in Tompkins County right now is $11.67 an hour with health insurance, twelve seventy eight without health insurance. We do a lot of organizing around that. But 12 years ago, we had organized with the paraprofessionals that were making like $6 an hour. With a union, they had a union and they were making $6 an hour. And after a year-long campaign with us working more in the community, um, it, it jumped from 6 to 10. We had like a, a protest rally with like 500 people, a lot of petitions signed. Uh, it was a very successful campaign, and it kind of gave us the impetus to start an organization at that time called the Tompkins County Living Wage Coalition, and we were organizing around living wage issues. What we found out very quickly was um, while a lot of people that are making poverty wages want to have higher wages, it's not something, you know, like a McDonald's worker is, you know, we're not going to magically transform the situation where everybody's making a living wage at once. So we wanted to find a way to get people in the door um, and with the chance that they would, you know, that we could be organizing together. And it's a constant, you know, it's constant work for us to do this because um, people, we started Workers' Rights Hotline then six months into 2003. And probably in that first year, it had like 50 cases. And we had a really big case early, very early on where um, four workers from a pizzeria just on the border of Cornell University in Collegetown um, were basically sleeping in the basement of the pizzeria, um, being paid $4 an hour. The minimum wage at that time was $5.15, yeah. working 70 hours a week and not being paid overtime. So um, at that point, mindful of what Raina just said about the legal system, which I would very much agree with. We actually went to the Attorney General at that point, who was some guy you've probably heard of named Elliot Spitzer, who was looking to create an upstate presence. And, and you know, basically a lot of times in New York, kind of the, the way some people upstate, including myself, it seems like everything's directed towards the city in some ways. So Spitzer's, all of his activity as Attorney General was more, more downstate. So he wanted to kind of get some notoriety upstate, so he took this case on and got a nice settlement for the workers. And we started at that point, then we started Immigrant Rights Center. Now, did you have paid staff at the time, or were they volunteers? We had two paid staff, like 20 hours a week at that time, and I was one of the two. Well, interesting. So, here now, tell us more. Could I ask the source of your funding? Then or now? Then. Um, we, at that point, we had a fiscal sponsor a nonprofit at Cornell that sponsors other organizations and they gave us like twenty thousand okay. dollars. But we, we almost immediately started developing a database of local individuals. So that's been very significant, kind of like kind of getting local individuals to contribute to what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. I'm not sure what train of thought it was. <laughs> Where are we? Where we left off. <laughs> <laughs> <I interjected. laughs> well, you had um, you get you settled the case with the uh, right. students at the pizza shop, and that was what year? Two thousand four. Okay. Right. So since then, what what other kinds of activities have you been involved with? Well, um, so you know the workers' rights hotline has become very integral to our work. So you know the first it, it would steadily increase every year how many cases we would get, and we're we're open to the every worker, regardless of race, gender, documentation, we don't make distinctions. Um, so we're up to probably close to 400 cases a year at this point. 
Um, so it's, you know, I, I would say it's a really excellent model in some ways because I think it allows us, you know, we see where the community is rather than deciding. We do campaigns, separate campaigns, but the, the real advantage of doing a workers' rights hotline is that you're actually seeing what's out there in the community and what people care about, like what people are experiencing in the community. Um, we, I, I'll be happy to say that it took us 10 years to get to this point, but on we had a number of workers coming from a local nonprofit agency, an Ithaca Community Action Agency, that were upset about their treatment over the last 10 years. And you know, we always tell people, you know, a lot of times bullying is not going to change in the workplace. Unfair terminations are not going to change in the workplace. The list of things that can go wrong is not going to change unless you start a union. So these workers at this local community action agency took us up on that. And we've been a part of it to some extent and actually voted for the union on January 3rd. So that was quite a 10 year anniversary celebration. And then a month later, we had workers come to us from a local charter school um, with 30 employees. And they decided to unionize and affiliated with NYSIT and were voluntarily recognized by, by the principal and, and the management at this local charter school. So, you know, these are like, oh, like to hear that. ultimate success stories in some ways. Very good. Very nice. And um, to follow up on what Bill had asked earlier, so what's your funding source now? Um, unfortunately, like 65% foundations and grants, which is a real problem. We've gotten uh, a big grant for the last six years from some people have heard Capital Campaign for Human Development, and that's going to go away in two months. So we're scrambling to make that money up. We get other grants. We get about $30,000 a year from individuals locally. And that's just with sending out fundraising letters with no follow-up. This year, we're actually going to be doing, um, we're cultivating major prospects, if you will. And we're going to be sitting down with people and, in essence, deepening our relationship with them and asking them for more money. Kind of the plain and simple way to put it. Yeah, we get that. <laughs> well, we're going to come back to talk sure. about um, how you publicize your programs and that kind of a thing. But Caroline, if you don't mind you know, giving us a little bit of a rundown on how your center got started um, and what kinds of things have served to kind of keep it motivated and going. I'm Caroline Kim T. Honey, and I'm representing the Worker Center of Central New York. I'm the coordinator. Um, yeah, it's, um, I think it was started in 2008, and um, we also received funding from grants from um, the, a minor amount from, from contributions, and we're trying to you know, increase that. Um, and uh, from the Occupational Health and Clinical Center, there's some um, money through that. Um, and, um, you know, so that's, that's like a constant thing. And uh, the um, leadership team, several people are very good at grant writing. So we actually got a couple grants just in the past week that we're excited about. So, um, but one of the, um, one of the things that happened before I, I was at the center uh, with uh, Rebecca Fuentes, when she was the coordinator, uh, was at the state fair, which maybe some of you have heard about. And these were actually workers uh, from Mexico who had a visa. And um, they were working at a food stand. Um, I believe that the owner is from Brooklyn. Um, and every year he has a, a stand for Greek food at the fair. And he had uh, these workers living in just horrendous conditions uh, and they were just like all eaten up with bed bug bites and you know underfed and um, basically not being paid being paid like he'd just shell out a few dollars every now and then um, and you know I'm sure like as, as you've seen like a lot of times the um, these employers will like hold the person's paperwork their passport and so that that person really feels um, you know enslaved um, that they can't go, you know, they can't move on anywhere else. And um, I think that there's uh, a lot of times people think if somebody has a visa, they're not going to be um, prone to that kind of exploitation. But this was a perfect example of that. So um, Rebecca Fuentes and Pat Rector, um, <coughs> another activist, um, brought this to, to the attention of the, uh, I think it was the Federal Department of Labor. And ultimately, the workers did recover thousands and thousands of dollars in wages. And, uh, and you know, the community made a pretty big stink about it. So um, this 
particular vendor was denied the next year when he again applied to, to have a stand at the state fair. Um, so that was uh, one of the cases with, with more publicity. But um, definitely since I started in October, uh, I've seen that there's just countless uh, wage theft cases, um, often in construction, uh, janitorial work, and definitely farm work. I mean, we have dairies, like in Syracuse, we have dairies in every direction. So, um, and I think it's just the tip of the iceberg. Like, I just have this feeling that a lot of um, workers have not heard of any of these worker centers. And, um, you know, until they do, we're, we're not going to even know how many cases there are. But, um, you know, on the, on the few dairies, really, out of all of them that, that we've been able to, to visit and make contact with workers, um, there's just, like, rampant um, abuses, uh, wage theft, the living conditions are, are like, some, in some cases, unrecognizable that this is housing. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, the employers will say, um, you know, in some cases, if somebody moves, they'll say, well, they didn't give me notice, so I'm not going to pay them. Um, you know, they'll, they, they'll say, oh, I found out this person's illegal. You know, this person's undocumented. And so, you know, obviously they knew all along, but this is the excuse that they make when I, when I call them. So uh, that's what I've seen a lot of, is, is wage theft cases and also uh, just discrimination cases, which um, I found to be more, more tricky. Like, I'm not sure I'd love to hear other people's ideas of, of what to do in some of these cases. And that's like in factory work, like uh, we've heard from um, a group of Cuban workers that feel that they are constantly um, discriminated against in, in their job and like made to do the worst work and the worst, um, the worst area of the factory. Um, so there's a lot of discrimination cases and a lot of cases like what you were saying, Pete, about, um, about bosses just being really nasty, like really, really mean, abusive, bullying. Um, some cases with hotel workers. <coughs> So it's it's really it's really a mix, but I'd say uh, the number one would be like the dairies. That's what uh, I see the the most vulnerable workers uh, are on dairies, and they can't get the visas because it's not seasonal work. So um, and they're very isolated. Like some of the dairies, I've you know just driven through the country, but I would never have seen that housing. Like I right. I just drive by, you know. But um, fortunately, we have um, a man in our community in Syracuse. Trinidad Ramos, who um, <clears throat> he, after like 30 years, has his green card now. So, you know, he's in a good situation to be able to safely travel with me. And um, he's been taking me to some dairies that I never would have found otherwise. Uh, and he knows them because a few years ago he was um, selling tamales with his wife and, and, you know, seeking out these different farms. And so he has, a, has formed bonds of trust with some of the workers. So, I mean, that's another thing is that they're understandably um, very wary, um, very fearful if just, you know, a random person stops by. So it's uh, important to have somebody who knows somebody um, in order to establish trust with them. So that's what, uh, that's what's been occupying a lot of my time. So, so do you, ha you have paid staff at the <coughs> center? Um, yes, uh, I have 20, <coughs> I work 20 hours a week and uh, Rebecca Fuentes, uh, is no longer working as coordinator, but she's doing uh, health trainings and uh, and also outreach. Uh, so, so yeah, she's been uh, very helpful and kind of showing me the ropes. So. It's got to be frustrating to have a 20-hour-a-week job when you know there's 60 hours a week worth of work to do. So. Well, I end up working more than 20 yeah, hours a week. You do. <laughs> yeah, so. Raina, why don't you tell us a little bit about the work you've done here in Rochester? Hi, my name is Reina Ramolete Hayashi, and I'm with the Worker Justice Group here in Rochester. I also am an attorney at Empire Justice Center, and I represent workers who are victims of wage theft. Um, I guess it's kind of the history of it. We're, we're just very new here, and we're just still trying to get things off the ground, which is why we invited both of you here to kind of learn more from you. But um, I guess. I came here with with this idea because I was. Reina, please speak louder. I'm sorry. I know you can. <laughs> um, so I came here uh, as a as an attorney fellow with the Empire Justice Center to do wage theft work, and got involved in Occupy Rochester when it started here, and 
as you all know, you know, that was an opportunity where um, kind of the emphasis was on the disparities in wealth and power in this country and uh, what better place to talk about disparities than in the workplace. And so we started uh, a working group, uh, the Worker Justice Working Group out of Occupy Rochester and, and started this community conversation about how we might be able to address some of these disparities. And um, that was in January of 2012. So we've been meeting regularly since then. And um, how it's, initially we, we, we talked about what our vision was um, and it's kind of grand. Um, and we talked about an organizing model that was based on what I was familiar with at Casa Latina in, Rock, in um, Seattle, excuse me. Um, and a lot of the initial referrals, and I guess still, have come out of my office, which is interesting because, you know, Pete, um, they use a, a worker rights hotline, and essentially the calls I'm answering at my job, that's kind of what it is. I'm getting calls from all kinds of workers who are facing all kinds of problems at their workplace, and my work is so limited that I can't help everyone, and I'm only one person. And so I've been trying my best to refer workers who want support to this weekly meeting at the Flying Squirrel, um, where people can get advocacy, can learn about their rights, um, can feel like they're part of a community, and, and potentially like take the problem into their own hands and, and build campaigns around those struggles. We haven't really done a campaign yet. Um, it's still kind of, um, we're still trying to figure that out. Um, but we have had a series of trainings we did last summer, which was really successful. Um, brought quite a few workers in that I've, I'm working with on cases personally. Um, and organizers in the community that were interested in learning about workers' rights. We've also had a couple of uh, community building events which have been really successful, um, but the day-to-day -day kind of grind, um, there's just been kind of a handful of us that um, are continuing to push. Um, so I'm just trying to figure out a more sustainable way to integrate uh, people's needs for immediate services, like this survival work, uh, which is what I do on, on a daily basis, to an organizing model so that we can, we can um, leverage that kind of anger. Because the workers that I see are, are typically the ones that get to me are the fiercest leaders at their workplace, the most outspoken. They've already been disciplined a bunch of times. They're really indignant. Um, and, and these are the kinds of people that we do want to organize because they've already taken that risk and they already understand that things are wrong. Um, and, and the danger with my job is that a lot of people hand their problems over to me because it's a ser service-oriented model, they hand their problems over to me and it's, instead of you know, seeing it in this larger context of political, economic, and social power and, and understanding how they fit in those power structures and figuring out ways to, to build around that. So, um, so yeah, I'm talking to a lot of workers. We haven't quite figured out how to bridge the gap, um, but we're learning every day. So, and I'm you know I'm dealing with mostly wage theft cases. So, there's a bunch of interesting cases. Similarly, cleaning work, um, healthcare, construction. Um, I have a, a large group of, of monolingual Spanish-speaking workers who were recruited to do post-Sandy cleanup in New York City from the Rochester area who haven't been paid a penny for their work. Um, so there's lots of things that are going on that people don't know about, and I feel like there's huge missed opportunities, and I would love you know, to kind of keep building, so. Thank you. Um, any questions for our panelists so far?